In the 1960s, we began to do organ transplants at the Cleveland Clinic uh, in a serious way. We were, it was the beginning of the kidney transplant research program and process. And in the course of doing this, it became clear that we just couldn't take an organ from one person and give it to another person without experiencing potential severe adverse consequences. And we today generally understand that two people have to, quote, be a match in order to accept an organ from somebody else or to donate it. So the question is, what does that mean, being a match? Well, the immune system responds to large structural proteins and other molecules that reside on the surface of our cells because the immune cells migrate through our body constantly looking for anything that is not self. Bacteria, fungus, virus, parasite, whatever, that shouldn't be there. And then of course it is our defense against those things, so when it finds things that are not self, it kills them. And that's basically what it does to an organ that doesn't match the recipient. The immune cells find the organ cells see that the receptors aren't self and then destroy the organ. So we began to search for ways of matching people so that they could receive an organ from another person. And what we looked at were the receptor sites on the surface of the cells. Fortuitously, all of the organs in our body have cells that display the same sets of receptors. So if I take white cells out of the blood and I look at the receptors on the white cells, I will know what the receptors look like on the kidney, the heart, the liver, or the lung. Those receptor sites, therefore, are called human white cell receptors, only we swap leukocyte for white cell. HLA, human leukocyte antigens, are also predictors, as we gathered data on what those receptors looked like and the variety of receptors, we began to understand that certain receptors were always present when people had certain illnesses. And suddenly these white cell receptors had predictive power in helping us understand about susceptibility. One of my colleagues, Richie Shoemaker, started to look at five specific receptors because they had a high level of predictive power in 1993. And he has looked at them in every patient he's seen in his practice in the hopes that he'd find patterns that might make sense. What he discovered was in his practice, because he lives in Maryland where Lyme disease does exist, he treats a fair amount of patients with Lyme and he observed that not everybody got better when they were treated for Lyme. They would end up symptomatic for years later. He found five specific pedigrees that said and predicted that the person would have post-Lyme syndrome. Later in the 90s, he dealt with an organism in the ocean that turned the water deep turquoise and killed massively the fish that were present because it imparted a neurotoxin in the water. People apparently didn't even have to go in the water. If they walked down the beach and the surf was up, the mist in the air had the organism in the droplets. It landed on their skin, they broke out in a rash, and within hours, they couldn't think. Most of those people, 75%, went home and in a couple weeks got better. 25 or so percent did not get better and could not get better. And they had a new pedigree, different from the five that were post-Lyme syndrome predictors. So now we had two categories, people who couldn't do Lyme, couldn't do turquoise, Tide, and a group that couldn't do either. They were multi or double susceptible. Around the time that he discovered that, he was given an award, Family Practice Stock of the Year for 2000 or 2001 for the state of Maryland. And he gets very sick himself because he's spending time in a moldy, damp environment 
And at that point, he starts to look at his patients for issues related to water damaged environments. And he discovered four new pedigrees that would predict that people couldn't get better after they got out of the water damaged environment. And once again, the dual susceptible individuals for turquoise tide and post Lyme syndrome also could not clear the poisons associated with their exposures to mold and they would not self heal. These pedigrees have been published by Dr. Shoemaker and he refers to it as, as the Rosetta Stone. I met with Dr. Shoemaker in 2007. I spent the day in his clinic. He was very gracious, shared a lot of what he was doing. And when I came back, I started to do that testing as well in my toxicology clinic. In my toxicology clinic, I had two distinct populations. I had people who had spent time in water damaged buildings, and I had people who had been ill from exposure to chemicals, who were either ill from the chemicals or hypersensitive to chemicals, but had not been exposed in water damaged environments. What I observed when I came back and did his testing was that every single one of my multiply chemically challenged and sensitive patients had one of the three multi-susceptible patterns that he had discovered. And every single one of my water damage building ill patients had one of either the multi-susceptible patterns or the four that he had seen with water damage building, I can't get better situations. They are powerfully predictive and they help know how we should tailor our treatments for our patients because people who are monosusceptible have different problems than the people who are multi-susceptible. But both groups are imminently treatable. So if the HLA markers predict who are going to have troubles clearing the toxins, it needs to be understood that it's not really very specific. It doesn't tell me exactly which genes are missing, but the patterns hold. And it is clear that one group of patients are multiply challenged and are missing multiple segments of their detox array and others they have less deficiency states in their detox arrays and so there are certain circumstances that they can't tolerate but not nearly as many as the people who are multi-susceptible. So the question is both of them are still having the same problem. They're accumulating poisons that they cannot clear metabolically and the solution to the problem is to do three things. Number one, avoid exposures that are going to manifest and amplify your symptoms. Two, use agents like charcoal, clay, or cholestyramine that act like sponges as they go through the gut and they adsorb onto their surface the positively charged organic compounds which include the poisons. But they also will get some of the good guys and so we encourage simultaneous supplementation with multivitamins twice a day because all water soluble vitamins are gone in 12 hours or thereabouts and antioxidants and compounds which help the energy producing spark plugs of the cell called the mitochondria to produce energy because one of the things that has become imminently clear with these illnesses is that people who are hypertoxic are holding on to an array of poisons, many of which often interfere with energy production and protein synthetic processes within the cell. And if you interfere with protein synthesis and you interfere with energy, you are destined to experience multi-organ system impacts. They may not be total organ failures, at least not initially, but gradually over time, you're constantly working against a greater and greater handicap of toxins as your body tries to just carry out its normal metabolic functions. And in particular, the heart and the brain are targeted when mitochondria or the spark plugs and energy producers of the cell 
are poisoned and compromised.